Seven. Equality. Part one. Attempts are sometimes made to force the New Deal ideas of equality onto the American Revolution or rebellion, or to see U.S. history as a long struggle to realize what the 20th century liberal believes. The result has been historical confusion. It should be noted, however, that attempts to read the revolution as egalitarianism were first made by enemies of the Continental Congress who sought to tar the colonial cause with the brush of radicalism. Thus, one Tory poem described the rival suitors of the maiden liberty with such ridicule. After John Presbyter, Will Democrat came next, who swore all men were even and seemed to be quite vexed. That there's a king in heaven? Will cursed the hilly country round because it made unequal ground. Since the colonials were and are accused of being capitalistic smugglers with a little more truth, we can discount this Tory humour. Discussions of equality are usually characterised by a fuzziness of language since the term is usually a political slogan and as such is evasive of meaning. A few of the many concepts of equality can be cited as a step towards clarification of the issue. First, the rational ideal or concept of equality has been influential in modern history. In this faith, an abstract concept of man is held to be true irrespective of any and all circumstances concerning the individual. This is essentially a religious faith, but having been affirmed by humanists who pride themselves on their rationalism, the name can be used even as its irrationality is noted. In terms of the rationalism of this school, man is logically a certain kind of being possessed of certain natural attributes of which equality is central. This is the reality concerning man, all factors pointing to another condition are ruled to be historical, cultural or environmental accidents. Hence the accidents must be eliminated and the reality allowed to flourish. Second, the scientific doctrine of equality, while in essence the same as the rational, saw its proof not in reason but in science. Thus behaviourism assumed all human materials to be equal, and Watson believed every man to be capable of all things if totally conditioned by behavioristic science. So-called scientific socialism, similarly a latter-day quote-unquote rationalism or religion of man, has often used this doctrine. Third, there is the doctrine of empirical equality, which holds that equal conditions or success imply equal men. Thus, the American Indian has often assumed the equality of white men as equally successful and assumed his superiority to the Negro. We fought, but they became slaves because of unequal factors. Socially, this doctrine is assumed as people strive to attain a certain degree of wealth and circumstance and assume that they are thereby entitled to move in a particular strata of society as equals. This concept thus has reference to external factors and conditions. Fourth, the concept of political equality in the sense of equal suffrage is affirmed. All men are, in terms of certain principles, that is, age and character requirements, eligible to vote. In California, various extensions of this concept have been proposed, dropping the reading requirement for suffrage and the automatic restoration of suffrage to ex-convicts. Elsewhere, a lowering of the age requirements has been suggested. The 19th Amendment, 1920, was in part an expression of this concept. Fifth. Sexual equality, also expressed in the feminist movement, is an assertion that the differences between men and women are accidents in the philosophical sense, their reality being a common and an equal condition. This concept is again a byproduct of quote unquote rationalism and humanism and presupposes that differences are invidious and uniformity ideal. Civil equality is a sixth definition of this concept. In this doctrine, all men, irrespective of political and other conditions, are equal before the law.
and equally eligible for taxation, jury duty, military service and other responsibilities of citizenship. This again was not a characteristic of the Federal Union in its origins. Slaves were the conspicuous exception. Taxation rested on property on the county level, not on all persons. Not all served or do serve on juries or in the armed forces, although totalitarian regimes strive for this goal in their total war concept. Emigration is restricted. Certain political tenants are forbidden and have no status before the law's parties. The law establishes and enforces certain differences. To speak of justice is not thereby to speak of equality. Seventh, equality of condition or total communism is also held. Equality of condition, as Cooper noted, means total communism and anarchy, since government institutes a fundamental inequality as soon as some are given a position of authority, however limited, over others. Numerous other definitions of equality could be cited. An eighth will suffice, since it is, in terms of modern thought, central. Equality is a mathematical term, and it represents an abstraction, and is an important concept in dealing with abstractions. But it cannot be applied to the concreteness, wholeness and diversity of life without radical distortions. The growth of the political use of this mathematical concept has contributed to political and social confusion in the modern era. Equal and unequal are valid terms in their place, but untenable concepts elsewhere. It was the French Revolution which made the idea of equality a major political factor, although its previous history cannot be underrated. The colonials made use of the word, and it appears in the Declaration of Independence, but in what sense? Its first and paramount use therein is usually bypassed. The Declaration affirmed it now to be, quote-unquote, necessary for the United States, quote, to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them, end quote. Rosenstock Hussey has noted the meaning, quote, The colonies desired equality with the motherland. The French word égalité, the rallying cry of 1789, meant equality within one country. Equal the citizen should be, regardless of vocation or profession. The American word equality in 1776 was much less individualistic. The whole body politic of the colonies was jealous of the pretensions of the body politic at home. The colony of Massachusetts called itself the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The name United States recalled the United Kingdom. George Washington could be compared with the noblest and best type of English gentleman. The American state papers were written in a peerless style of parliamentary English. The content of the American Revolution was no novelty, no new discovery of the nature of man. It was, first of all, an assertion of the equal rights of the pioneers to have their English way in the new world. The inferiority complex of many educated Americans has its counterpart in the epoch of independence. The unquestioned leadership of Europe is to give way to an equality of the new states with the old monarchies, or, as the preamble of the Declaration says, quote, an equal station among the powers of the earth, end quote. This equality of 1776 still belongs to the Anglo-Saxon world of values, whereas the Egalité of 1789 was a radical outcry of men's individual nature. The first version of equality had been, we the colonies are the peers of the motherland. The second version, 11 years later, to cognizance of the tremendous universality of every word that is uttered by human faith. End quote. As Malin has also observed, quote, independence meant not isolation, but equality of independent sovereign action within the family of nations. End quote. The second use of equal in the Declaration had reference to men. Quote, 
We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end quote. This revised draft, submitted by Jefferson on June the 28th, 1776, was based on the first article of the Virginia Bill of Rights, written by George Mason and passed by the Virginia Legislature, June the 12th, 1776. Their common meaning will better appear when both are viewed. The Virginia Bill of Rights reads thus, quote, A declaration of rights made by the representatives of the good people of Virginia assembled in full and free convention, which rights do pertain to them and their posterity as the basis and foundation of government. Section 1. That all men are by nature equally free and independent and have certain inherent rights of which, when they enter into a state of society, they cannot by any compact deprive or divest their posterity, namely the enjoyment of life and liberty with the means of acquiring and possessing property and pursuing and obtaining happiness and safety. End quote. As the Bill of Rights continues to specify its legal doctrine, it becomes apparent that this is a document by Virginians for Virginians. It is, quote, by the representatives of the good people of Virginia, which rights do pertain to them and their posterity, end quote. It may perhaps be disillusioning to recognise this limitation, but it is the historical reality. And the Declaration likewise was governed by a limitation. The equal men were the freeborn colonial men. They were distressed by the entangling legal fact of slavery, and almost half of the men favoured its abolition legally and over half desired it, but in the Constitutional Convention they favoured unity over a forced decision, believing that slavery would soon disappear. But, at the most, their opinion was that the Negro was equal to other Negroes and did not have a place in American society. It is easy to read into the past, where we see actions or words comparable to those now held desirable, a similar motive or rationale. Thus we find very early a demand for abolition, as witness the Reverend Samuel Hopkins and others. The existence of slavery in the colonies was quickly regretted and steps were taken to end it. But the legislation towards that purpose is revealing. Thus, in 1692 in Virginia, legal provision was made for the manumission of Negro slaves, but on the condition that the Negro be transported out of the country within six months. This legislation is indicative of the general temper. Slavery was regarded as an evil, even by slaveholders, and its existence as inevitably doomed. For most Americans, the abolition of slavery meant also the abolition of the Negro from American life. Liberia was founded in terms of this hope, which was not peripheral but basic to much American thinking. The American Colonization Society, founded in 1817, was organized to resettle Negroes in Africa, a hope advocated by Washington, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, John Marshall, Andrew Jackson, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, Abraham Lincoln and others. Lincoln, in his debates with Douglas, made it clear that he felt that the Negro was inferior and separation was necessary. Indeed, many statements made by these men as commonplaces of their day would today tar a man with a charge of racism. The American Colonization Society was very quickly approved by men in high places and by the Georgia and Tennessee legislatures. Chapters of the society were established throughout the South, especially in Virginia, Kentucky and Tennessee. Quote, of the 130 anti-slavery societies organised in the country, more than two-thirds were in the South, end quote. However, when in 1824 the Ohio legislature, joined by eight other states, asked Congress to consider general and gradual emancipation and colonisation at federal expense, it was ignored by the South. Nonetheless, in 1832 the Virginia legislature came very close to adopting abolition. 
The political overtones of the situation were clearly apparent in the fact that South Carolina took the lead in secession under Lincoln's election. South Carolina had suffered heavy losses economically through both slavery and cotton and had declined in eminence both sectionally and federally, and its bitterness was political. This political bitterness was reciprocated by many Northerners who had no desire for abolition and less desire for any common life with the Negro. Thus, while there was much feeling on Christian or humanitarian grounds against slavery, there was, prior to the Civil War, equally strong and stronger feelings against the Negro as a part of the Republic. Tocqueville noted this, and the fact that free Negroes in the North dared not presume to be equal with the whites. Quote, on the contrary, the prejudice of the race appears to be stronger in the states which have abolished slavery than in those where it still exists, and nowhere is it so intolerant as in those states where servitude has never been known. Not only is slavery prohibited in Ohio, but no free Negroes are allowed to enter the territory of that state or to hold property in it. End quote. Allen's studies have confirmed this fact. Quote, in the free states, with few exceptions, the free Negro did not exercise the civil rights of free white men, and in the states bordering the Ohio River on the south, free Negroes were not wanted. The original institutions of those states had been formed by the small former elements from the slave states who were predominantly anti-slavery and anti-Negro, end quote. Tocqueville had commented on the absence of a lower class and an aristocracy. In spite of this, Cooper felt there was more inequality in the United States than elsewhere. In the sense that there was a wide variety of differences, cultural and societal, this was in a sense true. Cooper rightfully denied the validity of the concept of equality. The evil of slavery was widely granted in the South as well as the North. The political use of the fact of slavery was premised largely on other than moral concerns. The United States was, in the Supreme Court and Presidency, largely dominated by the South from its inception until 1860. There is no understanding of the era apart from this fact. One may well wish that slavery had been the moral issue of that time, but it still remains true that an immoral and political use of this moral issue was made by various northern groups without respect for the consequences to Negro and White. Lincoln was concerned with the Federal Union more than with slavery, but many radical Republicans were more concerned with the creation of a national state over the dead body of the South and the Federal Union. The situation facing the country in the 1850s was thus a difficult one. Other pressing problems had been sidetracked and the moral issue of slavery subordinated in terms of a political conflict. Quote, in the event of the emancipation of slaves, there were, in the simplest possible form of analysis, three possibilities from which to choose for the solution of the race question. One, a mixed racial society. Two, African colonization, three, white supremacy based upon segregation in one of three forms. To most people, both North and South, the first was unacceptable. The second was highly acceptable but proved impracticable. As of the 1850s, except for a very few extremists, the solution narrowed down to a choice of forms of segregation, isolation of free Negroes, or slavery. Geographical isolation of free Negroes took the form of exclusion of free Negroes from free states. Manifestly, that was acceptable only to a few states and was especially attractive to new territories, but as a general solution was an absurdity because there was no place within the United States for them to be segregated. Either the Negro must be moved or the white people emigrate, Isolation might be achieved by the creation of a biracial society, and to a certain extent that was being done, but placed the free Negro in a subordinate position. Reduced to this order of reality, the Negro remained in slavery as the most effective method of segregation 
even though probably more than 80% of the white population of the slave states were without slaves, and there is a reason to believe a large part of them were definitely anti-slavery as a matter of principle. End quote. Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, March 4, 1861, stated that his consistent stand had been non-abolitionist. Quote, it is found in nearly all the published speeches of him who now addresses you. I do but quote from one of those speeches when I declare that I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. End quote. The people had, he held, the quote, constitutional right, end quote, of amending their form of government, quote, or the revolutionary right to dismember or overthrow it, end quote, but apparently not of, quote, civil war, end quote. The South chose to fire. Scott urged adoption of the Anaconda Plan, whereby the South would be forced back into the Union within a year by economic blockade and without bloodshed. The radical Republicans, however, wanted not simply war, but a prolonged war of attrition and the reduction of the South followed by its humiliation. Lincoln acceded to these ideas, changing his views towards Reconstruction only towards the end. On July the 17th, 1862, quote, An act to suppress insurrection, to punish treason and rebellion, to seize and confiscate the property of rebels, and for other purposes, end quote, made provision, quote, for the transportation, colonization, and settlement in some tropical country beyond the limits of the United States of such persons of the African race, made free by the provisions of this act, as may be willing to emigrate, end quote. On September the 22nd, 1862, Lincoln declared that the colonization effort would be continued and further implemented by legislation. In his second annual message, December the 1st, 1862, Lincoln asked for money to carry out the already approved colonization of Negros and noted that, quote, some would retain them with us, end quote. The matter was a subject of a communication on March the 12th, 1864, Lincoln sending the Senate a report of funds expended for colonization. Earlier, April the 16th, 1863, a Haiti colonization plan signed by Lincoln was voided because the U.S. seal was not affixed and Lincoln had subsequent doubts as to aspects of that plan. The Emancipation Proclamation must be set in this context of colonization hopes. However illusory, they were a long-standing consideration and were legally enacted by Congress. The Negro was to be emancipated from slavery, and many hoped and believed the United States was to be emancipated of the Negro as late as March 1865, a month before his assassination, Lincoln was considering the removal of the entire Negro population from the United States. Andrew Johnson, in his first annual message, December the 4th, 1865, suggested another approach. Quote, the country is in need of labor, and the freedmen are in need of employment, culture, and protection. While their right of voluntary migration and expatriation is not to be questioned, I would not advise their forced removal and colonization. Let us rather encourage them to honourable and useful industry, where it may be beneficial to themselves and to the country, and instead of hasty anticipations of the certainty of failure, let there be nothing wanting to the fair trial of the experiment. End quote. Many churchmen and union generals dedicated themselves to the cause of the freedmen. The radical Republicans were more concerned, however, with using the Negro as a weapon for bludgeoning the South. Johnson, himself a Southerner, spoke apparently with an eye on both the South and on the interventionist financial powers associated with the radical Republicans when he continued, quote, Now that slavery is at an end, or near its end, the greatness of its evil in the point of view of public economy becomes more and more apparent. Slavery was essentially a monopoly of labour, 
and as such locked the states where it prevailed against the incoming of free industry. Where labor was the property of the capitalist, the white man was excluded from employment or had but the second best chance of finding it, and the foreign emigrant turned away from the region where his condition would be so precarious. With the destruction of the monopoly, free labor will hasten from all parts of the civilized world to assist in developing various and immeasurable resources which have hitherto lain dormant. The eight or nine states nearest the Gulf of Mexico have a soil of exuberant fertility, a climate friendly to long life, and can sustain a denser population than is found as yet in any part of our country. And the future influx of population to them will be mainly from the north or from the most cultivated nations in Europe. From the sufferings that have attended them during our late struggle, let us look away to the future, which is sure to be laden for them with greater prosperity than has ever before been known. The removal of the monopoly of slave labour is a pledge that those regions will be peopled by a numerous and enterprising population which will vie with any in the Union in compactness, inventive genius, wealth and industry. Here there is no room for favoured classes or monopolies. The principle of our governments is that of equal laws and freedom of industry. Wherever monopoly attains a foothold, it is sure to be a source of danger, discord and trouble. We shall but fulfil our duties as legislators by according, quote, equal and exact justice to all men, end quote, special privileges to none. The government is subordinate to the people, but as the agent and representative of the people, it must be held superior to monopolies, which in themselves ought never to be granted, and which, where they exist, must be subordinate and yield to the government, end quote. Translated into present-day terminology, this would imply that Johnson did not believe in either legal segregation or legal integration, being opposed to monopolistic use of law. Likewise, no economic group, corporate, business or labour, could expect a legal position based upon favouritism, in that this would constitute monopoly. At the beginning of his administration in April 1865, Johnson said to an Indian delegation that, quote, While I have opposed dissolution and disintegration on the one hand, on the other I am equally opposed to consolidation or to the centralization of power in the hands of a few, end quote. The colonization hope continued with many, and on June the 16th, 1866, Johnson supplied in answer to a Senate resolution, quote, information touching the transactions of the executive branch of the government respecting the transportation, settlement and colonization of persons of the African race, end quote. In his veto message of February the 19th, 1866, Johnson spoke sharply concerning the raids on the Treasury in the name of suffering Negroes. He denied that the Constitution gave any ground for such legislation for any or all classes and races. Quote, A system for the support of indigent persons in the United States was never contemplated by the authors of the Constitution, nor can any good reason be advanced why, as a permanent establishment, it should be founded for one class or colour of our people more than another. Pending the war... Many refugees and freedmen received support from the government, but it was never intended that they should thenceforth be fed, clothed, educated and sheltered by the United States. The idea on which the slaves were assisted to freedom was that on becoming free, they would be a self-sustaining population. Any legislation that shall imply that they are not expected to attain a self-sustaining condition must have a tendency injurious alike to their character and their prospects. The appropriations asked by the Freedmen's Bureau as now established for the year 1866 amount to $11,745,000. It may be safely estimated that the cost to be incurred under the pending bill would require double that amount, more than the entire sum expended in any one year under the administration of the second Adams. End quote. On March 27, 1866, Johnson expressed to the Senate in a veto message 
his strong dissent in relation to an act making federal citizens of all Negros, and also Pacific States Chinese, against all normal requirements of citizenship. Quote, Four million of them have just emerged from slavery into freedom. Can it be reasonably supposed that they possess the requisite qualifications to entitle them to all the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States? Have the people of the several states expressed such a conviction? The bill, in effect, proposes a discrimination against large numbers of intelligent, worthy and patriotic foreigners and in favour of the Negro, to whom, after long years of bondage, the avenues of freedom and intelligence have just now been suddenly opened, must of necessity from his previous unfortunate condition of servitude be less informed as to the nature and character of our institutions than he who, coming from abroad, has, to some extent at least, familiarised himself with the principles of a government to which he voluntarily entrusts, quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end quote, end quote. The rights of the states to determine citizenship were being invaded, Johnson held, quote, laws of discrimination, end quote, with respect to real estate, suits, contracts, and marriage were the general rule. Some of these were probably unconstitutional, but their remedy was not further unconstitutional action. Quote, the legislation thus proposed invades the judicial power of the states. End quote. Johnson recognised that the congressional concern was not the Negro, but the destruction of the South as a means to the erection of a national statist order. Quote, it is another step or rather stride towards centralisation and the concentration of all legislative power in the national government. The tendency of the bill must be to resuscitate the spirit of rebellion and to arrest the programme of those influences which are most closely drawing around the states the bonds of union and peace. End quote. The same point was again made in a veto message of January the 5th, 1867, with reference to, quote, an act to regulate the elective franchise in the District of Columbia, end quote. To grant suffrage to people unprepared to exercise it could only lead to one quite obvious end, quote, controlled through fraud and usurpation by the designing, anarchy and despotism must inevitably follow, end quote. The same point was again made in a veto message of January the 5th, 1867, with reference to, quote, an act to regulate the elective franchise in the District of Columbia, end quote. To grant suffrage to people unprepared to exercise it could only lead to one quite obvious end, quote, controlled through fraud and usurpation by the designing, anarchy and despotism must inevitably follow, end quote. In his third annual message, December the 3rd, 1867, Johnson a dedicated constitutionalist, posed the question clearly and simply, quote, The Union and the Constitution are inseparable. To me, the process of restoration seems perfectly plain and simple. It consists merely in a faithful application of the Constitution and laws, end quote. The Constitution provided the best guarantees for all concerned. What was proposed and in process of institution was unconstitutional and racist, calling for the vengeful domination of Southern whites by blacks. It is manifestly and avowedly the object of these laws to confer upon Negros the privilege of voting and to disenfranchise such a number of white citizens as will give the former a clear majority at all elections in the Southern states. This, to the minds of some persons, is so important that a violation of the Constitution is justified as a means of bringing it about. The morality is always false which excuses a wrong because it proposes to accomplish a desirable end. We are not permitted to do evil that good may come. But in this case, the end itself is evil, as well as the means... The subjugation of the states to Negro domination would be worse than the military despotism under which they are now suffering. It was believed beforehand that the people would endure any amount of military oppression for any length of time 
rather than degrade themselves by subjection to the negro race. Therefore, they have been left without a choice. Negro suffrage was established by Act of Congress, and the military officers were commanded to superintend the process of clothing the Negro race with the political privileges torn from the white men. The blacks in the South are entitled to be well and humanely governed and to have the protection of just laws for all their rights of person and property. If it were practicable at this time to give them a government exclusively their own, under which they might manage their own affairs in their own way, it would become a grave question whether we ought to do so, or whether common humanity would not require us to save them from themselves. But under the circumstances this is only a speculative point. It is not proposed merely that they shall govern themselves, but that they shall rule the white race, make and administer state laws, elect presidents and members of Congress, and shape, to a greater or lesser extent, the future destiny of the whole country. Would such a trust and power be safe in such hands? But if anything can be proved by known facts, if all reasoning upon evidence is not abandoned, it must be acknowledged that, in the progress of nations, Negroes have shown less capacity for government than any other race of people. No independent government of any form has ever been successful in their hands. On the contrary, Wherever they have been left to their own devices, they have shown a constant tendency to relapse into barbarism. In the southern states, however, Congress has undertaken to confer upon them the privilege of the ballot. End quote. What was proposed, Johnson declared, was the creation of quote, such a tyranny as this continent has never yet witnessed. End quote. It was a design to quote, Africanize the half of our country. End quote and by military force maintain the racial supremacy of the Negro at a cost capable of reducing, quote, the nation to a condition of bankruptcy, end quote. Together with this program was the degradation of money, in that paper money had been made a legal tender. The result was that bad money was driving out good money and was, in the process, robbing the labouring classes. Paper money was the legalised destruction of the working man and of virtue to the profit, quote, of the few, end quote. Powerful financial interests, to whom the US government was only a tool for the robbing of the people, were in control, and Johnston was an obstruction. The background to this movement was a complex one. The American Democracy Party, which, after Jackson's day, was the party of compromise, became, with the Republican triumph, the party hostile to all compromise, and thereby pushed for war, standing now, however, not on principle, but on the vested interests of a slave-holding aristocracy. Johnston's attempts to compromise tensions and restore constitutional principles thus clashed with both Southern intransigence and Northern radical Republican hostility to all compromise. The radical Republicans opposed any restoration of the South to its proper status in the Union, since such a move would make the Republicans a minority party. Thus, the North fought to preserve the Union and to keep the South from leaving it, but, having won, refused to permit the South to be in it except in the form of puppet governments. More than the Civil War intervened between the first half of the century and Johnston. Darwin's concept of evolution was responsible for a great revolution of thought the conservative merchants, farmers, bankers, planters and others who predominated until 1860 were supplanted by a new breed, no longer, quote, adherents of old-fashioned Christianity, end quote, but social Darwinists. The old order was overthrown by, quote, a great domestic tragedy that synchronised chronologically with an intellectual revolution overseas, end quote. Andrew Carnegie expressed the receptiveness of this new order to Darwin in his autobiography, describing his reading of Darwin and Spencer, quote, I remember that light came as in a flood and all was clear. Not only had I got rid of theology and the supernatural, but I had found the truth of evolution. All is well since all grows better became my motto, my true source of comfort, end quote. 
Morality was now not a matter of personal relationship to and growth in Christ, but of biological process, inevitable and hence not personal. Carnegie, coming from a background of French revolutionary thought and chartism, now found his bent scientifically quote-unquote confirmed. Other quote-unquote capitalists of this new order followed in the same pattern of thought. Morality ceased to be a matter of character since all is well or legitimate because of necessary and biological growth, then limitations on man are obsolete. The South was accordingly plundered by American and foreign financial and industrial interests with the help of puppet governments and many southern financial and industrial groups. The Union League organised Negros into secret societies to further its domination and exploitation of the South and savagely fought Johnson and Washington. What was championed in the name of capitalism and radical republicanism was actually interventionism and socialism, class socialism, the class favoured being the financial interests. The New York Union League Club could boast in 1887, Chauncey M. Depew then being its president, that, quote, to the Union League Club was largely due the impelling force which carried through the Reconstruction Acts and put into the Constitution of the United States in permanent and enduring form the results won upon our battlefields, end quote. It could confidently and with reason assert in discussing, quote, its future, end quote, that, quote, there is no state or national convention of the Republican Party which dares put before the country nominees who would receive its disapprobation because that would be the damnation of the ticket, end quote. In the selection of McKinley at a later date, the Chicago Union League Club and its member, Charles Gates Dawes, took primary credit. Prior to the Civil War, although a radical ferment was apparent in the 1840s, the character of American life was not collectivistic or individualistic. It was Christian, familistic and personal. A sense of community, personal and familistic, generally prevailed. Evolutionary thought emphasised impersonal forces and the cities, previously governed by a Christian concept of government and community, now became sanctuaries of impersonalism. Truly rational men meant impersonal and rootless men, and the cities, even after the development of roadways and ease of transportation made them economically less advantageous to industry than decentralised industrial development, continued to grow because they met a psychological need. The flight from personalism and responsibility, from roots and from history, meant a flight to the city. Corporate and statist impersonalism and collectivism grew simultaneously with, quote, rugged individualism, end quote, an anarchistic and impersonal individualism which moved in contempt of personal, moral and Christian considerations. The so-called, quote, 66 capitalists, end quote, were often socialistic in terms of their presuppositions, government manipulators who believed in the principle of class legislation and state controlled towards that end. A point of difference with Marxism was in part a question of power. Which class would control the state? Aspects of such government manipulation existed prior to the Civil War, especially as a result of the constitutional provision for a federal postal service. This ostensibly innocent provision led to extensive subsidies to railroad and steamship corporations and created a new and powerful class whose wealth rested on government subsidies, manipulations and even outright fraudulent practices, as the Cavode investigation indicated. The results were disastrous for both the character of federal government and that of American life. It is not surprising that Savage has termed this period following the Civil War the, quote, Second American Revolution, end quote, and, quote, a revolution in which most of the rebels were numbered among the Yankees, end quote. To maintain this revolution, it was necessary to prevent the restoration of civil rights to the South and also to eliminate Johnson. Johnson's resistance was a major aspect of the history of constitutionalism. Southerners were of little help to Johnson in that, then and later, they were ready to use all the practices of, quote, carpetbag, end quote, government for their own benefit, 
including the toleration of Negro suffrage, if it remains subject to their control. Johnson's position was thus a difficult one. In a veto message on, quote, an act to admit the state of Arkansas to representation in Congress, end quote, June 20, 1868, Johnson called attention to Article 8, Section 5 of that act, requiring that, quote, all persons before registering or voting, end quote, take an oath which contained the following clause, quote, that I accept the civil and political equality of all men and agree not to attempt to deprive any person or persons on account of race, colour or previous condition of any political or civil privilege or immunity enjoyed by any other class of men, end quote. Johnson called attention to the fact that this clause was inserted in the face of the known fact, quote, that a very large proportion of the electors, end quote, did not believe in it. Quote, Is it intended that the denial of representation should follow? End quote. Was it not likely that such measures would only lay the groundwork for future trouble? In his fourth annual message, December the 9th, 1868, Johnson returned to the monetary problem. The answer to Johnson's conscientious and evil constitutionalism was, on a specious charge with reference to Stanton, an impeachment attempt. His resolute struggle to deal with the issues constitutionally has gone largely unappreciated. Even conservatives like Garrett have dismissed him as, quote, a man who had the common misfortune to be born without wisdom, end quote. Despite many defeats, Johnston did hinder at points and prevent at others a flagrant status reordering of the United States. The damage done, however, was real, and in the South, whereas the Negro had nominal assistance from the Freedmen's Bureau, the non-slaveholding white yeomanry emerged from this era extensively impoverished and embittered. This meant the impoverishment of most of the South, for only one of every 16 Southerners had owned even a single slave. In all this, genuine concern for the Negro had been very slight. A Negro editor in Charleston, Richard Harvey Keane, in 1871 observed, quote, When the smoke and fighting is over, the Negroes have gained nothing and the whites have nothing left, while the jackals have all the booty, end quote. Abolitionist leaders showed more hate than love in the whole. It was not surprising then that, after the use of the Negro as a political bludgeon against the Southern white, there was a readiness to allow the Southerner a free hand on the condition of political concessions, so that the South became a political ally of Republican forces ready to concede its freedom in this respect. At first, the Negro received better treatment in the South than in the North, Southern populism began by resolving to, quote, wipe out the colour line and put every man on his citizenship irrespective of colour, end quote, to cite Tom Watson's words, and only gradually turned to racism. The Southern Negro was now the object of prejudicial legislation, while all Southerners suffered through discriminatory railroad rates, allegedly imposed by the financial interests controlling the railroads, when the Negro became a better potential tool than the Southern white and his northern migrations made him a political factor, he was again made the object of political use in the 1930s and thereafter. Thus, in a century's time, the Negro exchanged slavery to an individual for slavery to the state. In both conditions there are advantages, but both constitute slavery. Whatever the political or legal picture has been, the honest fact is that, for the most part, the white American has not felt much sense of unity or equality with the Negro. Compassion, charity, kindliness, friendliness, bitterness, resentment, hatred and exploitation, these things have all existed, but the sense of unity or equality has been virtually absent. Neither Jefferson nor Lincoln can be cited as champions of anything resembling unity or equality. Cooper denied the validity of the concept of equality. The existence of government and property alike militated against equality, 
in that both instituted differences among men. Moreover, quote, Equality is nowhere laid down as a governing principle of the institutions of the United States. Neither the word nor any inference that can be fairly deduced from its meaning occurring in the Constitution. Desirable in practice, it can hardly be, since the results would be to force all down to the level of the lowest. All that a good government aims at, therefore, is to add no unnecessary and artificial aid to the force of its own unavoidable consequences and to abstain from fortifying and accumulating social inequality as a means of increasing political inequalities. End quote. For Cooper, the American federal system was a better guarantee of man's liberty than the general professions of other countries. He felt that the majoritarian principles of France made it basically hostile to liberty, and that, quote, the government of Great Britain, which, though freer in practice than that of France, is not based on a really free system. End quote. A concerted effort has been made in recent years to introduce equality into the United States as a political goal. The Boas School of Anthropology has sought to give it a scientific foundation, a position which has gained widespread support, although with some dissent arising in recent years. The South, however, has sought legally to perpetuate segregation. The basic issue is too seldom raised. Are not both legalised integration and segregation interferences with freedom of association? In terms of the reality of the Negro's presence in America and his growing participation in American hopes, two solutions in the main are possible. The first is the statist answer. The sense of corporateness is sought on the national level or with some on an international level. Persons and groups will not be allowed any divisive practices or racial freedom of choice, all of which will be or are in process of being banned by law. Creedal or religious differences are likewise being prescribed. There must be a total unity in terms of the state, and hence internal differences must be suppressed. Corporateness on the state level will, however, destroy all corporateness on the personal, institutional and group levels, so that no solution to the personal fact will ensue. Enforced uniformity, it is assumed, will in time produce unity, but the price of that unity will be the suppression of liberty and individuality. In addition, the status sense of corporateness requires the destruction of federalism and constitutionalism, and thus this same sense of corporateness is denied to the federal union and, to a lesser extent, to state and country. The second answer is thus indicated. The sense of corporateness was denied by the constitution and the federal structure to the political bodies and made personal and societal. The establishment of any church by Congress was forbidden as one aspect of this reservation of the rights to association and of corporateness. The non-corporate nature of the federal union ensured a free society. The corporateness of the local units and groups made possible closed groups in terms of particular faiths, races and classes. This is an inevitable choice. If the corporateness of the state is demanded, individual corporateness and freedom are destroyed. Deny the corporateness of the state and, on the local level, the reality of prejudices and divisions must be faced, and they can militate against Negro, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Jew, college graduate, alien or anyone else. The free development of local corporateness is, moreover, the very necessary agency of its growth and of its incorporation. It will also create a demand for the responsible development of groups or persons seeking status within society. Thus, pride, responsible achievement and self-respect function rather than legal encroachment as a means to advancement. Legalism is a procrustean bed and is not only in violation of but also destructive to natural growth. Hints of the possibility of such a free development have been forthcoming of late from the South. 
The American position had its origins in English separatism, which early denied the validity in principle of the legalistic approach to religion. Henry Barrow, separatist and martyr, 1550-1593, shepherd and theologian to the Pilgrim Fathers, was accused on examination of two particular things. First, he was charged with rebellion against authority. He resented this charge and any allegation of Anabaptism. Quote, there is not a sentence in our writings, end quote, he declared, which hints at absolute independence of, quote, the superior powers that God hath set over us, end quote. Rather, they sought for the establishment of true authority in terms of God's word. Second, he was charged with seeking to level or equalize. Barrow denied this strongly. The church is indeed a brotherhood, a communion of saints, but, quote, Though there be communion in the church, yet there is no equality. End quote. Communion, not equality, was the original and Christian concept of society in America. And the effects of this concept have long lingered. They underlie and require a federal and constitutional structure. Communion is a religious concept. Equality, as it is often championed today, is a rationalistic and scientific abstraction, a concept best promulgated in French revolutionary thought. Basic to this concept of equality is a utopianism, a desire to end history, and an intolerance for the very human fact of problems and tensions. The religious concept of communion describes history as both conflict and development, and sees as necessary the integrity of communion and its growth in terms of a supernatural calling and law. The focal point of true unity cannot be racial, but must be Jesus Christ. And the community of Christ cannot be used as a weapon of social change, but is rather a place of Christian growth. Quote, Let every man abide in the same calling wherein he was called, end quote. 1 Corinthians 7.10 Man's hope is not primarily in civil law and social change, but in Christ, not to be realised in dead works, but through a living and working faith, itself of grace in Jesus Christ the Lord. As Malin has observed, quote, Whatever effect the revolutionary philosophers of the late 18th century may have had in modification of religion in the United States, the core of the Christian plan of salvation survived, regardless of denomination. Men could not save themselves. They could find salvation only through divine intervention, the blood sacrifice. Christianity and the generalized idea of progress were irreconcilable. End quote. In this Christian pattern, the integrity of differences was recognized. In the New Testament, there is neither segregation nor integration. Jewish converts organized Jewish churches and Gentiles their own congregations without barring one another. Each was to develop in terms of his history and tradition within the framework of Christ's body. Community, not uniformity, was the emphasis. Quote, to prevent the Jew from remaining a Jew would be to abolish freedom and to reintroduce a law into the church. That is why Paul always opposed uniformity in the church. End quote. The modern anti-biblical answer is environmentalistic. Change man's conditions and his character will be changed. As Harry Godden has stated it with reference to the Negro, quote, The first thing is freedom. Responsibility follows. End quote. American solution to problems was neither collectivism nor individualism, but rather Christianity. The sense of community was thus basic. This made for a slower solution to problems, but a more basic one. As problems arose, men voluntarily associated themselves in missionary, educational, charitable and other associations in order to deal with the situation. One of the results of such activity was the major missionary movement of all church history, another the greatest educational advance into higher education up to 1900. These were not status movements, they were the outcome of voluntary associations. 
Tocqueville noted that the Americans, having a constitution which was anti-statist, sought to combat the other tendency, individualism, by means of associations. Associations forestalled status action and prevented the atomism of individualism. Quote, Wherever, at the head of some new undertaking, you see the government in France or a man of rank in England, in the United States you will be sure to find an association. End quote. Tocqueville, in commenting on the tendency of democracy to concentrate political power, added in a footnote, quote, Men connect the greatness of their idea of unity with means, God with ends. Hence, this idea of greatness, as men conceive it, leads us into infinite littleness. To compel all men to follow the same course toward the same object is a human notion to introduce infinite variety of action, but so combined that all these acts lead by a multitude of different courses to the accomplishment of one great design is a conception of the deity. The human idea of unity is almost always barren, the divine idea pregnant with abundant results. Men think they manifest their greatness by simplifying the means they use, but it is the purpose of God which is simple, his means are infinitely varied. End quote. The quote unquote democratic sentiment some scholars see in the American Revolution was generally a religious product, a sense of communion and community. Thus, Miller has called attention to quote, New England levelism end quote, and the quote unquote democratic attitudes of the Scotch Irish farmers and immigrants of that era. In the New England regiments, quote, a large part of the officers were farmers and the sons of farmers who hardly pretended to gentility. End quote. There was a conflict between these officers and those representing a Church of England background. Even Washington at this point felt required to check quote, the officers of the New Jersey line for mingling up their grievances with those of the men. Common soldiers, he thought, could not reasonably expect anything more than food and clothing. That was all they received in other armies. Their pay, by reason of the numerous deductions to which it was subject, being little more than nominal. Washington regarded as an expensive anomaly the plan adopted in New England and some other states of providing for the families of soldiers. End quote. The democratic sentiments that captured Pennsylvania from 1776 to 1784 was, according to Miller, not so much democratic as religious, Calvinistic, Presbyterian, a belief in communion, the levelling of men before God by faith, and not in terms of the modern concept of equality. The same Christian temper permeated New England, as well as other areas. Democratic ideas did enter in much later, but even then much of what is called the progress of democracy was actually the extension of evangelical and Arminian Christianity in 19th century America. The country was, as Cooper saw, very highly undemocratic, but revivalism extended a Catholic faith throughout the country and opened up strong lines of communication and a new variety of the Christian sense of community. This sense of community was often narrow and hostile to outsiders, but also often generous and hospitable. Its virtues were great, and its defects very real, but there can be no strong sense of community without a sense also of the sanctity and integrity of the community. In the South today, both Negroes and Whites have a stronger sense of community than do Negroes and Whites in most areas of the United States. The tremendous possibilities inherent in the development of true community require a readiness to accept the limitations of historical process and maturation. To destroy the sense of community is not only to destroy liberty, but also the Christian church. As Tocqueville noted, statism seeks not only to keep men in a state of, quote, perpetual childhood, end quote, but also to use the church, if not destroy it, the question then is this, will corporateness be statist or will it be free and Christian? Will it be an aspect of community life or will it be a doctrine of state? 
The pattern of state-enforced segregation is clearly statist and a denial of free association. But the demand for coercive integration is no less statist and a denial of the true sources of community. In 1875, the Reverend Edward Cleveland expressed his faith in progress through freedom. In the field of strife, but still, while man in freedom makes his way, some good develops oft from day to day, secures advancement in the field of strife while dipping oars in the stream of life. While under ban we only see the dwarf, as men seem pygmies on the distant wharf, but give full scope to man's unshackled soul to think and speak and judge without control, and great development of mind will rise and great achievements will the world surprise. Then will the mind throughout creation soar and wonders of the universe explore. Inventions make to aid the human race and think substantial and ascetic grace. Religion gains its utmost purity when its development is wholly free. <laughs>